Welcome, everyone. It is um, the start of our event for tonight. My name is Dr. David Chow. I'm the director of the Center for Asian American Christianity. Uh, it is my delight to introduce our speaker, Reverend Dr. Al Tizan. Um, in this series titled Dialogues in Asian American Theology and Ministry, this series provides Asian American ministry leaders, welcome everyone, with a forum for dialogue, support, and critical reflection on ministry by Asian Americans, especially in Asian American ecclesial contexts. Participants in the hybrid dialogues gatherings are highly encouraged to share their thoughts and ask questions as we dialogue with our featured speakers. Al Tizan is lead pastor of Grace Fellowship Community Church in San Francisco, California, and affiliate professor of missional and global leadership at North Park Theological Seminary outside of Chicago. Al has engaged in community development, church leadership, advocacy, and urban ministry in the U.S. and in the Philippines. Previous positions he has held include Executive Minister of Serve Globally, the International Ministries of the Evangelical Covenant Church Denomination, Holistic Ministry Director, and then President of Christians for Social Action, and Associate Professor of Holistic Ministry at Palmer Theological Seminary of Eastern University near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Al is the author or editor of seven books, including Whole and Reconciled, Gospel, Church, and Mission, in a Fractured World, and the book that he will be discussing today, Christ Among the Classes, The Rich, the Poor, and the Mission of the Church. Al received his PhD in Missiology from the Graduate Theological Union and is an ordained minister of the Evangelical Covenant Church. Al and his wife Janice live in the San Francisco Bay Area in close proximity to their four grown children and seven grandchildren. Al, welcome, and the floor is yours. David, thank you so much. <clears throat> Virtual but live greetings from San Francisco to all those who have gathered in person, uh, as well as those who've attended like, or attending like, like I have from some other place in the world. Uh, again, David, uh, it, you know, thank you. It always feels good to be invited back by someone to make another presentation. It just, it means to me, uh, uh, among other things, I'm sure that I didn't bomb the first time. So thank you for inviting me back to the center this time to talk about uh, insights from my most recent book, uh, Christ Among the Classes. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, this this book was released into the world last spring, and uh, I have been facilitating discussions ever, ever since here and there um, surrounding its themes of wealth and poverty. Um, but this event today feels special because I'm addressing mostly or perhaps wholly an audience of fellow Asians and Asian North Americans. And by the way, for the sake of ease, I, I will use Asians as the catch-all word and do away with the hyphen to describe to describe us, whether we live uh, in Asia or the United States or Canada or anywhere else, if that's all right with you. So when I say Asians, I mean Asians, wherever it is, wherever we live. Because we are mostly Asians here, um, we can or, or should or maybe even must discuss Christ's call to faithfulness regarding economics from an Asian perspective. This is such an important topic. Yes, for all, but perhaps uniquely for Asians. At the risk of overgeneralization, I will say that the pressure placed on us as Asians to succeed in life, and by that I, I primarily mean economic and material success, makes the call of this book especially intriguing and perhaps more challenging. I'm guessing you all know what I'm talking about here. Pursuing success means going through school with straight A's. And I mean straight A's, no minuses, no B's, no none of that. Straight A's, be accepted into a prestigious school, Ivy League preferably, marry up, 
Uh, get a prestigious, well-paying job in your field, preferably medicine or engineering or maybe law, and live in a house of your dreams where you raise your family of two and a half kids in the safe environs of a gated or guarded community. That is the American dream times infinity for Asians. And many of us have succeeded in this way, enough that we have been labeled the model minority, right? And as tempting as, I, as it is to go down that route, I will try to stick to the plan here. Um, but before I leave this rabbit trail completely, uh, I do want to recommend a book entitled Asian Americans and the Spirit of Racial Capitalism by Jonathan Tran. I am actually right now in the middle of this book, and I am, I am, uh, I'm, I'm being blown away here. Um, to me, Tran discusses the model minority myth, among other things, uh, in a unique and, and compelling way, and I, I want to recommend this book. So for Asians, the pursuit of the American dream is not just to attain a level of individual material wealth or comfort and security, which I contend is the primary, if not sole motivator of white Americans. For Asians to achieve this level of success is also for the purpose of maintaining the honor of the family. Negatively speaking, if we don't succeed, then we shame not only ourselves, but the whole family name, past, present, and future. In fact, I do wonder if the familial dimension of socioeconomic success supersedes the personal gain dimension. In any case, what exactly is the call of Christ among the classes? The book is directed toward those who desire to love, serve, and live like Jesus, who both taught and demonstrated how to live faithfully among the poor and the rich of his day. It aims to speak to me and other non-poor people like me. In fact, <laughs> confession time, I wrote this book first and foremost for myself to keep myself accountable to the radical demands of the gospel. And uh, yeah, before I say anything else, I, I just want to make it clear that I struggle as much as anyone with the challenges that the scriptures pose to the wealthy. I'm convinced that in order for us to imitate Christ among the classes, we need to become more aware of the economic dimension of our discipleship. A phrase that I wish I had used more in the book is economic discipleship, because that's really what I'm talking about. If we define discipleship simply as following Jesus in the ways of Jesus, then economic discipleship refers to imitating Christ in his interactions with and teachings concerning the rich and the poor of his day. What I'd like to explore with you today is how the call to economic discipleship, i.e. following the ways of Jesus in all things economic, might look like in the Asian context. What does economic discipleship or being faithful to economic discipleship look like in the Asian context? The book's operating assumption is that the problem of socioeconomic injustice is not poverty. It's wealth or the pursuit of it. International development and nonprofit anti poverty fighting uh, organizations and missionary efforts among the poor mostly operate under the assumption that poverty is the thing to solve. But in actuality, the pursuit of wealth is the problem, and poverty is the consequence of it. Anyone who has taken seriously the teachings of Jesus regarding wealth and poverty has felt the dissonance between how we lived among the classes and how he lived among the classes and how we live among the classes. Jesus warned the rich. We tend to court them. Jesus was a friend of the poor. We tend to avoid them. Jesus taught that we cannot love God and money. We agree in principle, but in practice, we attempt to prove him wrong. Overall. Jesus taught that, but we live like this when it comes to money matters. Part one of the book attempts to paint a picture of Christ among the classes. How did Jesus interact with the poor of his day? How did he interact with the rich of his day? What did he teach? 
Uh, because of time, we're not going to go in depth with part one. Please, um, I'm going to make a plug for my own book here, but buy the book if you're interested in how I painted this portrait of Christ among the classes more fully. But for now, let me sum up part one with saying that Jesus was an advocate friend of the poor and a prophet friend of the rich. He was decidedly on the side of the poor while warning the rich of the dangers of their wealth. But the hope for us all is that Jesus loved and loves both the poor and the rich. Part two of the book is holding up this portrait of Christ among the classes as a mirror to us, the church. Does the church come even close, even remotely close to reflecting Christ among the classes? And if not, how can it get closer so as to become the church of Christ among the classes? Part two offers six what I call life movements that I believe would set the right trajectory for us as we seek to be faithful in the economic dimension of our discipleship. I want us to look briefly at each of these life movements and let me encourage us to, 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 to listen um, with that general overall question in our minds of what the possibilities and the challenges might be within these six life movements for Asian families and churches. Okay, so the first of these, the first of these life movements is one that goes from blindness to compassionate awakening. Now, in the book, I identified this movement as going from awakening to compassion, but really blindness um, to compassionate awakenings is more accurate. This, this movement tracks an internal uh, activity, a work of the spirit within our spirits, transforming head knowledge of poverty into heart knowledge of the pain and suffering of the impoverished. Unlike Jesus, whom I suppose we can say was woke from the beginning, the rest of us need to be awakened vigorously for some from the spell of the American slash global dream to the compassion of God's dream. Those whose eyes have been opened have awakened to the plight of the majority of the world who are desperately poor. Now, there are stats in the book, but basically the poor are the billions who are hungry and malnourished, vulnerable and powerless, illiterate and trapped, indebted and enslaved, exhausted and sick. They are the marginalized and ostracized, the abused and the trafficked. I am convinced that if Jesus were physically here, he'd be among these. And I'm convinced that Jesus is among them by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and calls the church to join him. The awakened, the awakened allow the real world of human need to grip them. Instead of intentionally averting their eyes uh, uh, to the plight of the poor, they allow the spirit to open them. And when their eyes open and remain open, um, their hearts break in the face of human suffering. And I believe that God can do something with hearts that have been broken by human need. So that's the first movement toward Christ among the classes, from blindness to compassionate awakening. A second life movement is from self-gain to generosity, from self-gain to generosity. Compassionate awakening has two sides. We see not only the needs of the world in a profound way as we awaken to God's dream, but we also realize, if we live in affluent societies, the abundance of our wealth relative to the rest of the world. This relative wealth came about because we pursued it. And we, were, we lived in a context where it is pursuable. We pursued it because we were taught to pursue it. Looking out for number one is a good way to summarize the American dream. And for Asians, in addition to looking out for number one, there is also the aspect of looking out for my family name and reputation. So perhaps if I had Asians specifically in mind when I wrote this, I would have called this section from self-gain and family acceptance to generosity. I'm very much looking forward to our Q&A because... Uh, I think it will be there that uh, some practical steps can be um, can be expressed in 
uh, going from self-gain or and or family acceptance to generosity. In any case, when we've when we're awakened by God's compassion, we realize that we become the rich whom the Bible cautions and warns. I can't tell you how uh, how it changed my uh, my my entire perspective when I began to uh, read passages of scripture addressing the rich, not as they and them, but uh, me <laughs> uh, and, uh, and my family. Um, things, things really changed for me as I, as I read the Bible in that way. That realization coupled with compassion, oh, that coupled with compassion for the poor that is now flowing from our hearts that was generated by the first movement that generates in this movement this thing called generosity now generosity is not just a synonym for giving it refers to liberal and lavish giving listen for example to zacchaeus that filthy rich tax collector in luke 19 8 who in his come to jesus moment said quote if i have defrauded anyone of anything I will pay back four times as much, four times as much. I'm not just going to pay back what I took. I'm going to pay back what I took four times. As Jesus, and Jesus himself, who confronted a rich young CEO in Mark chapter 10, said to him in verse 21, sell what you own, not some of what you own, but all of it, and give not, and give not some of the money, but all of it to the poor. Now, this sounds crazy for all, but perhaps more so for crazy rich Christians like us. Uh, give away all of it to forsake the vision of self-gain and family reputation as we develop the practice of kingdom generosity. That's what you're asking us? Well, no wonder the rich young ruler backed away and left. From self-gain to generosity is a difficult movement, but one that moves us toward imitating Christ among the classes. A third life movement that I discuss in the book is from accumulation to simplicity. To be truly, to be truly generous requires adopting a simpler lifestyle that is shaped by questions such as, how much is enough? Uh, does our lifestyle reflect any concern for the poor? We have so much stuff. Um, friends and uh, I, I i don't know about you but that picture is was pretty much my house growing up you know i remember embarrassingly um what we as a family of four brought with us to begin our first term as missionaries in the philippines to work with the poor no less among many other things i recall bringing a microwave oven a, a vcr if uh Anyone in, in the audience still remembers what a VCR is? A box full of VHS Disney movies for the kids. My CD collection, I have a lot of CDs. Uh, several bottles of tea tree shampoo. You got to have tea tree shampoo in the tropics. We, we brought a waterbed bladder and way too many clothes for each family member. <laughs> this is a far cry from Jesus' instructions to the first proclaimers in Luke 9.3. Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. We lugged those 10 80-pound boxes of all our worldly possessions through air, land, and sea like security blankets. <laughs> and we did so partly out of fear of scarcity, partly from the recommendation of veteran missionaries, but largely from simply living out what North American culture taught us we needed. Can you imagine Jesus traveling around Galilee with a trailer full of Western comforts? So during his, quote, off hours, unquote, he can really enjoy himself. The call to be more Christ-like regarding our wealth requires what we, that we move from an accumulated lifestyle to a life of simplicity. But simplicity doesn't mean deprivation. On the contrary, Simplicity means freedom. Less stuff brings more freedom because, because we have less to be attached to and to be worried about. I mean, let's admit it. We get attached to our stuff. So the more we have, the more attached we get. 
And conversely, the less we have, the freer we become, freer to engage in God's mission with freed up time and resources. Accumulation to simplicity. A fourth life movement that has helped me to align better with my best understanding of Christ among the classes uh, is to move from uh, proprietary rights to hospitality. Now, what do I mean by proprietary rights? Well, basically, it refers to the belief that I can do anything I want with what I own. Owning things or ownership is not the ultimate problem. But if ownership or private ownership leads to the idea that we have the absolute right to do absolutely anything we want with our money and our stuff, then we have crossed the line to proprietary rights. For example, several years ago, a couple in a Bible study group that I led bought a house. And in their glee over the next year, they gave regular thanks to God, crediting God for blessing them with a new home and with new furnishings for their young family. The rest of the group, including us, were genuinely happy for them. But in addition to giving thanks, they also express, expressed the protectiveness that seemed, um, that seemed unhealthy. Not only did they install a security system and build a fence around the property, nothing unhealthy about these things per se, they also didn't allow large gatherings in the house, even church gatherings in the name of good stewardship. Apparently, their understanding of stewardship meant preservation, not gospel use. They had spare rooms, but only for visiting family. One night, as they continued to overshare about their house and how they were caring for it, I challenged them hopefully lovingly, and ask them something like, if God blessed you with that house, don't you think you should open it up a bit? To which they replied, well, it is our house. <laughs> Listen to the proprietary rights there. It is our house, and we should be able to do what we want with it. Translated, mind your own business, O Bible study leader. The truth is, we don't have absolute rights over what we own because we don't ultimately own anything. Ultimately, and we know this in our minds, everything belongs to God and what we have has been entrusted to us to care for and use all, all these things at our disposal for Christ and Christ's purposes. If we really believe that, then we would have vastly different attitudes toward our things, we would become more hospitable like the early disciples. In Acts chapters 2 and 4, we see that the disciples had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. They saw their money and their things as serving all, which is a good way to understand hospitality, which is the opposite of proprietary rights. A fifth life movement is the one that moves from a savior complex to shedding our capes so that we can develop friendships among the poor. Hospitality opens the door for the non-poor and the poor to go deeper with one another, to establish genuine friendships with one another. And by genuine, I mean mutual respect, mutual learning, mutual transformation, the key word being mutual, by virtue of being in each other's lives. Now, we have to work at this. It just won't happen. To develop life-transforming friendships among those whom affluent society has deemed as below us is crucial if we're striving to imitate Christ among the classes. Without this movement toward mutually transforming friendship, the rich-poor relationship doesn't go beyond the realm of projects where the poor have nothing to give. They remain passive recipients of help from us. This creates a savior complex within us, which goes something like this. Without the generous, heroic actions of rich folk like us, the poor are doomed. The poor need to be saved. And it's the righteous rich, like us, who have come to save them. Even Jesus, the actual Savior, didn't have a Savior complex. Instead, 
he befriended the outcasts and sinners, which infuriated the religious leaders in Luke 15.1. If we want to imitate Christ among the classes, we need to shed the Savior complex and develop friendships among the poor. As mutual friends, we serve each other. Yes, yes, I, the poor have something to give to us. The materially impoverished represent more than objects to help. They are people made in the image of God equal in value in the eyes of God and capable of teaching us about the values of God. There's no room for the savior complex in the rich-poor relationship. And lastly, there is the life movement that goes from a place of safety to a place of solidarity. When we're side by side in solidarity with the poor, we are side by side with Jesus. It was, after all, Jesus who said, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, John 15, 13. The last movement we looked at focused on the friendship part, the moving from uh, Savior Complex to friendship, focused on that first part of Jesus' words here. Um, this movement, this last movement of from safety to solidarity, focuses on the laying down one's life part. This is the solidarity part. Just as Christ suffered for the sake of his friends, the church of Christ is called to do the same. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me, said Jesus, cannot be my disciple. In order to live out Christian solidarity, though, we have to overcome our natural impulse as well as our upbringing to live as safe a life as possible. Now, I want to qualify this. Safety and solidarity are not necessarily opposites, but solidarity often requires sacrifice and pain. In our striving to imitate Christ among the classes, personal safety cannot be the ultimate. Gospel work, and particularly solidarity with the poor, is inherently dangerous. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Nelson Mandela, Oscar Romero, Corazon Aquino, Malcolm X, Moses, <laughs> and many, other, uh, many others immediately come to mind because of their fame. But many others have forsaken a life of comfort, or at least a much safer way, who may not be as famous, but who are just as faithful and inspirational in their practice of solidarity among the poor and oppressed. Inspiring examples for me, include Father ben Benigno Beltran's work with the residents of S Smoky Mountain in Manila, Ash and Angie Barker's ministry with the people of Krong Tui in, in Bangkok, John and Vera Mae Perkins' work in development and reconciliation as they return to Jackson, Mississippi, and Jean and, and Joy Thomas's ministry among the rural poor in Fond de Blancs, a remote village in Haiti. These and the stories exemplify, and their stories exemplify solidarity that looks a lot like Jesus when he walked the earth. So these six movements, from blindness to compassionate awakening, from self-gain to generosity, from accumulation to simplicity, from proprietary rights to hospitality, from savior complex to friendship, and from safety to solidarity, these movements I believe we have control over as we submit to the Spirit to become more like Jesus in the world. Now, two things very briefly. Uh, first, these six life movements ultimately make up one movement toward a justice-oriented life. Um, discussing each of the six movements was to make the changes uh, we need to make in our lives more bite-sized and less overwhelming. It's one thing to tell people, hey, you have to practice justice and then leave it at that. Um, I, I wanted to see some of the, the dimensions of the practice of justice and see if, if we might be able to isolate them for the purpose of evaluating our own lives by them and uh, being able to make some changes in that particular dimension of, of uh, a justice-oriented life. So in the back of the book, I... Um, I created an inventory, a church among the classes, an inventory 
to uh, to just help us uh, discern where we are in in each of the areas that we discussed, and um, and and figure out ways. Uh, in fact, um, each section has, in addition to the inventory, a a, a box of um, of practical suggestions to move us closer to uh, well, getting a higher score in the inventory, but also uh, more importantly, how how to live more accurately or or um, fully um, in, into these movements. But it's just one movement, um, ultimately. It's, it's one movement toward Christ-likeness among the rich and the poor. Uh, one movement toward practicing justice in, in, a, in a faithful way as part of our economic discipleship. And, uh, and second, these movements uh, slash movement, capital M, is a downward movement. That is, we descend to justice. I see those blinded by the American dream, what I call classism in the book, as living in the clouds, indifferent to the plight of the underprivileged down below. We know from Matthew 25 and really the overall testimony of the Gospels that Jesus made and makes his home among and with the poor, oppressed, marginalized, and traumatized in the world. Jesus lives down there, not in the fluffy clouds far above the valley of poverty below. Our journey out of classism is a holy descent from what we consider the, you know, the, the pinnacle of life, which is as fragile as establishing our lives on nothing, uh, nothing more than vapor, the clouds. Um, our journey out of classism is a holy descent from there, the clouds, to join Jesus among the world's most vulnerable. Christ among the classes reminds us that insofar as we have loved the hungry, the thirsty, the immigrant, the naked, the sick, and the prisoner, we have loved him. 